So uh, Wade's off doing something fun today, snow skiing or snowboarding or sitting in a hot tub. I don't know what he's doing, but he's out there having fun with the kids up in Wisconsin, and you're stuck with me, so there you go. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items before we get into the sermon. Wilma Nia lost her granddaughter this week. Some or most of you may know that. If you don't, uh, sudden, 25 years old, tragic, um, keep her in your prayers. That, that's the least you can do. Betty Brown has been ordered to bed. She has a nasty case of pneumonia and they're on her second round of antibiotics. So uh, I'm sure that Betty and Tim and all of them, Patty, would appreciate your prayers there also. And um, Pam Barnhouse is here today. And I just, if I can get through this, I'm going to say what I just witnessed. There's a phrase in your song, healing is in your hands. And I turned around and looked at her. First she was like this, and then she just grabbed it and pulled it. Death came knocking at your door and you didn't answer. And we're glad. Three times. We appreciate you being back. Glad to see you here. Oh, thank you. I had my sermon earlier in the pew, just turned around and watching that. <clears throat> Here's the part where I'm supposed to say good morning, and you're supposed to say... Okay, that, now that we got that out of the way. Wade asked me to share today what my thoughts on the second word in our mission statement. We're going through something we went through in 2012. Uh, we have five words. We'll get to those a little bit later. But Mine is care today. Interesting day. Interesting word. And I'm going to use, uh, by the way, this is some of the sermon he did in 2012. I'm taking it and sort of massaging it and making it mine at his request and permission because we're just so different. I would, be, I would struggle trying to make his mine and he'd do the same with mine. So the thoughts are the same. Some of the phrases are the same. And near the end, you'll be able to tell where I just sort of took over. So, and that's all right. Um, <clears throat> We're going to use 1 John as the backdrop, and then I'm going to add my personal reflections about this church that we call home, and my observations and experiences over the past nearly 50 years as a member. I know it's hard to believe I've been anywhere for 50 years, but, and they didn't throw me out, but I've been here for almost 50 years. So 1 John, to begin with, we open the letter, the elder John speaks from tremendous experience to the Christians of the first century. He calls them to the remarkable task of caring for or loving one another. Those of you that are flipping in your Bible, you're going to have to forgive me because I'll just bounce around all over that and probably won't tell you where I am, but have fun trying to find it. That'll keep you occupied for part of the sermon. Um, yeah, somebody you give up? Good for you. He calls them to the remarkable task of caring for one another. As we love one another, we complete the work of Christ and reveal to the world God's love for them. Roger Zerbe, who suffered from Alzheimer's early stages, journaled this to his wife after a particularly troubling bout of forgetfulness. And this will no doubt bring back painful memories for many of you who have either experienced this in your own family or in family of friends. Honey, he starts out. Today fear is taking over. The day is coming when all of my memories of this life that we share will be gone. You and the boys will be gone from me. I will lose you even as I am surrounded by you and your love. I don't want to leave you. I don't want to grow old. I do want to grow old in the warmth of our memories. Forgive me for leaving so slowly and so painfully. Blinking back tears, Becky wrote, my sweet husband, I will continue to go on loving you and caring for you, not because you know me or remember our life, but because I remember 
you. I will remember the man who proposed to me and told me he loved me. The look on his face when his children were born. The father he was, the way he loved our extended family. I'll recall his love riding bikes, hiking, and reading. His tears at sentimental movies. The unexpected witty remarks and how he held my hand when he prayed. I will cherish the pleasure, the obligation, the commitment, and the opportunity to care for you because I remember you. This is the essence of what it means to love and care for someone. We care for that person even when they're unable to care for us. We care for that person not because of what they do for us. We care for them because of who they are. The picture of marriage is not unlike the church. The loving wife caring for her husband with Alzheimer's. The loving church caring for those within the church that are broken, hurting, and suffering. As most of you know, by now we're in our second week of the series of our mission statement. We're asking questions throughout these five Sundays. Who are we? What are we supposed to be doing? What are our key values, our key priorities as a congregation? So let's review the statement again. We are a spirit-led people gathered, that was last week's word, to care, that's this week's word, to gather and care for and empower each other by stewarding God's resources to impact our community for Christ. Five action verbs. To gather, to care, to empower, to steward, to impact. So what's it mean to care for one another? What does it mean to function the way like the wife caring for her husband? Maybe that's why women live longer than men. They're simply better at caring about things and each other than we are, guys. As we approach this subject, we return to the letter from the Apostle John, 1 John. It seems appropriate for me to take just a few minutes to talk about the letter. It is very likely, and agreed upon by many scholars, that this letter was written by the same John that wrote the Gospel of John. I'll share with you why they think that in just a moment. We know that John outlived all the other disciples. All the other disciples, except for John, died a martyr's death. Lousy, painful, ridiculously hurtful death. Around the year AD 67, the Romans moved into Jerusalem and destroyed the city. It is believed at that time that John moved to Ephesus. You might remember the city is where Paul spent much of his time. The church in Ephesus was very dear to Paul, hence the letter to the Ephesians. In the last third of the first century, we have John serving as an elder of the church. You can picture him much older, a man who had physically seen the entire story. He is the man who was a fisherman in the boat with his brother when Jesus called them to be his disciples. He walked with Jesus, watched him live, watched him die, and witnessed his resurrection from the dead. He watched the early church expand over the entirety of the Roman Empire. And now, he is writing to the church, admonishing them to be the church that God intended them to be. And I think that letter bodes well for us today, to be the church that God intends us to be. In this letter, John calls readers back to the three basics of the Christian faith. True doctrine, obedient living, and devotion to Christ. In the first chapter, verse 5, if you happen to want to find it, he says, because God is light. And because God is light, Christ's followers overcome all darkness. They devour, they will be devoured by the darkness. I like this word, devour. It doesn't say they'll be nibbled or bit or even eaten, but devoured. I think it has a sort of an evil, animalistic quality. In other words, for the other side, taking a shot at us, there will be no survivors. They want all we have to give and more. As John composes this letter, you'll find 
that is not a list of do's and don'ts. It is not a list of rules to live by. That would simply be too easy. Rather, it is a statement that Christ has done the work of salvation. In other words, we are not doing the work of Christ, but rather he is the work. We simply reflect that work. And living out our faith is living in the light. This dark world in which we live now has the light of Jesus being reflected by us. I know it may seem like I'm getting off track about caring, but just hang in there for a moment. If we can get the full force of this letter, I believe we can understand the whole idea of what it means to care for one another. 1 John starts out like this, and this will sound very familiar to you who've read the Gospel of John. That which was from the beginning. The Gospel of John starts out something like, in the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was there before the beginning. Same guy, same approach. That which was from the beginning. And then he says some very interesting statements that only someone who was there with him could make. Which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, and another translation of that means our hands have handled. He handled the Son of God. Probably shook his hand, gave him a back rub, hugged him. He handled the Son of God. This we proclaim, considering, concerning the word of life. What he's telling us is, he knew the dude at a level that allows him to make the statements that he's making. Okay, so we actually have this guy, a disciple of Jesus. Some would say John was Jesus' best friend. He witnessed God firsthand in the flesh. He watched this group of renegades become the church. He understands the dangers facing this fragile group. And so he writes them a letter to help them be all that God has called them to be. So what's in the letter? What are the key themes? Let's take a look. There are actually five. The first one is the reason he came for us, God entered the world through Jesus. Can you imagine actually hanging out with Jesus? He spent time with him. He got to know him. You'd think that John would have a pretty good idea of who Jesus was. So number one, he tells us the reason that he came. Number two, then after getting to know Jesus, you watch him die. You watch him give his very life for you and me. If anyone understood this, it's our friend John. So John understands that Christians are those who follow Jesus. They understand what Jesus did for them. Therefore, if they're true Christians, they live lives of light and love. They reflect who God is and what God came to do. Number four, a part of this response after we are a reflection, is to love God. Christians are called to love God. As Christians truly love God, they will obey Him, they will follow Him, doing all that He commanded them to do. And in summing it up, God is love, God is light. God came to us in the flesh through Jesus. Jesus lived among us. He, he loved us enough to give His life for us. He was raised from the dead, conquering darkness and sin and death. Our response to this kind of love and the living light of God is called caring. John, John begins in chapter 4 by encouraging Christians to test the spirits. There are many at this point in time who are trying to thwart the true message of Jesus. Not any different than it is today. There are many out there trying to make the church look like a fool. And saying Jesus never lived, and if he did, he was a liar, and he was married, and had kids. It goes on and on. Same thing back then. John says this. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome these negative influences. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. He's speaking to us as his children. He's a very old man. One who has experienced incredible truth. One who walked with Jesus, who was sitting there beside Jesus at the Last Supper. Who watched him hanging on a cross and who saw him risen from the dead. He tells Christians, you and I, that that spirit is within us. 
That spirit of God is within us. And this spirit in us is greater than anything that's in the world. So, we have the spirit of God in us, and we have the spiritual world out here. Look how John contrasts the two. First of all, he describes the spirit of the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world. And the world listens to them. How many times have you, maybe you've said it yourself. Have you heard someone who professes to be a Christian say, well, I can understand that point of view. That's a problem. Because once you start to understand, get too close to it, you may actually change your mind. He's saying the spirit's in us. If the spirit is in us, it will keep us from doing that. But look at what he says about us. Chapter 4, verse 6. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Those who speak truth attract people who want to hear the truth. Those who speak lies attract people who want to hear lies. So we have the spirit of God in us, and the spirit of the world is in them. They're so contrasting. They're so opposed to each other. They're like daylight and darkness. They don't belong in the same place. You never see daylight and darkness in the same place at the same time. One always overtakes the other. So what's it mean to live the Spirit of God? How does this work, how does this work out practically in our lives? So if you have the Spirit of God in you, it will manifest itself in love. And this love will be in will be apparent in the way that we care for one another. Pam needed help getting to her feet today. The young man on her, on her right, the young lady on her other side, cared for her enough that they physically helped her, they handled her to her feet. That's caring. That's what we're talking about here today. Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Let me repeat that using my word. Dear friends, let us care for one another, for caring comes from God. It's one thing for me to tell Debbie that I love her or her to tell me that. But we need to care for one another. Do those things that need to be done in the moments they need to be done without expecting a reward or caring back. That's caring. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. What if it read this way? Everyone who cares has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not care does not know God because God is love. It starts to be an itch that needs scratched. If you love God, if you love God you're from God. If you don't love him, you're not from him. Let that sink in for just a moment. And if loving is akin to care, then if you're not caring for people, you're not of God. Not me saying that. That's what the scripture says. Argue with them. We don't care for one another because we like... Jim's been my friend for a long time. I would care for him because I like him. That's not what it's talking about. We care for one another because... We don't care for one another because we like each other. That's not a reason. We don't care for one another because we share the same religious or political beliefs. We don't care for one another so that we will be cared for someday. We don't care for one another because it makes me feel good. We don't care for one another so we can get recognition. We don't care for one another because we're told to care. But our caring for one another is prompted and is rooted in God's love for us. And God's love for us is demonstrated most through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, that is the epitome of caring. So we're talking about a sacrificial caring, not one of convenience or timing or social awareness or fe feeling good. To truly care for one another in a Christ-like way, it must, must, must cost us something. Then look at what John says. Remember, he may be the only person alive who's actually seen Jesus. He's the only one probably who had physically been present with Jesus. But look what he tells Christians in the early church. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. The people we meet every day have never seen God. They've never seen Jesus. Their only shot 
There's our lives reflecting that love to them. That's the kind of awesomeness that's laid on our shoulders as Christians. We're their only shot. I think that's profound. It's heavy. It's extraordinary. It's also the truth. When we love one another, when we care for one another, God's love, his dying for us, is made complete, or the Greek word translated, perfected. It's complete. It's done. When God came to earth, when he lived among us, when he gave himself for us, it was not the end of the story. It was just the beginning of the story. It, it was sort of like a spiritual commencement, like the one you had in high school. When I was a little kid, I wondered why are they, they're commencing on something, but this is the end of it, because that's all the farther I could see. Not true. Those high school commitments are the jumping off point, just like Jesus' resurrection is the jumping off point for us. It's not the end of his life. It's the beginning of the ministry, and we're charged with reflecting that. And it is only complete or perfected when we express love for one another. It is only complete or perfected when we care for one another. We become the missing link. Without us, it doesn't link us. What did Jesus say the result of this work will be? That the world will know Jesus is sent by God and loved by God. And because of this love, the world will know that God loves them. How awesome is our responsibility to care? Is the only way God's love is evident to other people. It's when you and I care for them. That's why it's one of the five words, guys. I know it can be a bit confusing. John has a way of writing that goes beyond at least my understanding. But if you keep going back to these words, you'll see a consistent pattern. God sent Jesus. Jesus shows the love of God through his life and death. The love of God is embedded embedded in us through the Spirit of God, and as we love and care for one another, God's love is expressed and exhibited to the world. In turn, after all that, it's like an if-then statement in programming. If all this, then the world understands God's love for it. But not until all that's done. Not until he does his part, and we do our part, and then somebody who doesn't know Christ understands what the real deal is. The process is complete, the work is complete, the cycle is complete. Okay, here's some examples that I've witnessed over the last 50 or so years in this church. I was actually going to name names of both the living and the dead, but Debbie, my wife, suggested. Uh, I only meant by name those who have gone on to their reward. They can't complain if I miss them, right? But the ones who are still here might get a little upset if I mentioned someone, I mentioned Larry, and didn't mention Jim. Kind of way Jim is, so I gotta watch out for that. But I'm gonna mention their acts of caring that I've witnessed since I was a 12 year old boy. It's not intentional to leave anybody out, but it is predictable. Wade and I were just talking about this last week on the phone about how this particular church truly does care for each other. And we fight when we shouldn't, and we say things that we shouldn't, but at the end of the day, Pam can tell you. We care for each other. Okay, so in no particular order, just the way they popped into my ADD mind, how many of you remember Goldie Farmer? At least three. So all right, Goldie was the church hostess when Debbie and I were elementary school, junior high school. She was the head of the cafeteria at Ball Stores that was on the corner of Charles and Walnut where that lawyer building is now down the basement. Every Wednesday night, for the Wednesday night meal, we had these little, little bowls of salad, little things of jello, because Goldie took care of us, because Goldie did care for us. Merle Jones. Hospital visitation was his ministry. He was an employee of the Postal Service. There's also a hospital employee who's since retired, but still living, worked voluminous hours a week at the hospital, and he was our hospital chaplain for years. Took no money, gained no fame, 
but he was always there because he cared about us. A couple in our church reads to disadvantaged children. Their name doesn't get in the paper. They don't get any money. They just simply care about kids. Rain's a loaf of best. Their work with youth here is legendary to those of us who they touched. It's Harry Irwin's uh, in-laws, if that helps anybody. Ray's a, Ray, Ray Bess taught me more about grace than any book in the Bible because he lived it. Because he cared about me. These two guys are still with us, but one's moved on somewhere else and the other can't come to church much because of a physical. So I'm going to deviate from Debbie's request a little bit. Dale Jones and Marion Bradford. Some of you may know Dale comes occasionally to the first service. Marion lives somewhere in Kentucky, here somewhere now, he's probably retired. They had such a visitation ministry, there are people in this church who would not be here had it not been for them visiting them. Sometimes they were the first faces that they met from First Baptist Church because they truly cared and had a heart for visitation and bringing people into the kingdom. We have a professor in our midst who uh, works in a nursery and is also a prayer warrior. There are two men, at least, that paint here when no one is watching. Not because they like to paint, because they don't have anything else to do, because they care about us in this church. Anybody remember Lena Jane Lawson? You gotta be old. She was a Sunday school teacher here for over 50 years. She was a retired school teacher. Everyone who knew her knew she cared about them in a special way. There's a retired physician that runs around here giving away more free medical advice than Dr. Oz. Some of you know, I'm just not going to say his name. But he cares. 89 hours a week at the hospital, and he came here, and there was a line some Sundays. Free medical advice. And he spent time with each person like it was the only person he had to see that day. Because he cared. Two friends in our church, in their younger years, had a very profound jail ministry. Several couples in our church have had financial ministries through the financial arm of the church because they care. There's been a woman around here that's worked with children and youth for decades simply because she cares. Bill Reed. <laughs> he was an interesting guy. He was a uh, jeweler, had the jewel shop here in town for a number of years, suffered a stroke right in the same building where you work, I think, right down the road there. And so he couldn't really sing anymore, so he started shoveling snow here at the church in his 70s. Healthy ex exercise, don't you think? So, so when Bill passed, Larry Van Devender, if you know Larry, he's got a great sense of humor. I have a weird one, so together this is really funny. The first Sunday it snowed about six inches after Bill was gone, Larry came and said, where's that Bill Reed? The point is, he cared enough, we knew when he was gone, because no one shoveled this town pick a sidewalk. Now they do now. But for a while, no one cared quite as much as Bill. I'll tell you another story about Bill Reed. My uncle Herschel Holbert suffered a stroke, a lot like Bill. He was in Ball Hospital, and I used to go up and visit him every night at 10 o'clock, because he's my uncle. No, no, no award needed. And every night, when I'm walking in at 9.55 or 10, who do I pass in the parking lot? Bill Reed. They were buddies because when Bill had his stroke, my uncle Herschel stood at his bedside and sang to him. They were both in the choir. Those two guys cared for each other at such a deep level. Taught me something. Two young deacons, one goes here now, one doesn't. Had a ministry of visitation and taking communion to shut-ins. There are others of you who have done that. I'm just recalling these particular two because they cared about those who couldn't make it to church on Sunday. There have been countless others of you who have taken care of widows and children who lost their parents because you simply cared about them. And there's more. And again, I almost hate to start naming names and putting a list out there, but those are the ones that came to my feeble mind. It's all true. 
If you know of others, go thank them. I think we often think of church, of our relationship with God, as a belief or an intellect. If I can just believe that Jesus is God, we call ourselves believers, like that gives us a special pass. And I know what we mean. But if that's all it is, is okay, I've got a head knowledge. If I can intellectually ascend to the facts, the historical truth of Jesus, then I'll escape the judgment of God. But John's words, they challenge us here. He suggests this truth may not be enough. It's not enough just to have the head knowledge and believe. It is not enough to gather, to show up, to sit in a pew for an hour on Sunday. We must love one another. We must care for one another. We must speak to others in business meeting in a caring and selfless way. I had a liberal, very liberal seminary professor by the name of Al Jenkins. I don't remember another phrase he said the whole time I was there, but I remember this one. He said, one of the first signs of maturity is when you see the strength in your opponent's argument and the weakness in yours. The other guy just might be right. The strength in your opponent's argument and the weakness in yours. Great advice, I think. And according to John, if we fail to care and love for each other, then we are liars. We're playing a game. We're fooling ourselves. Ours is a counterfeit faith, not the real deal. It may look like the real deal on Sunday, but when we try and cash it in, it may not be accepted. We simply don't get it. But if we truly get that God loves us, then we will truly love one another, and we will care for one another. This is the part where the band will do whatever you do to get loose because we're getting close. This is what it means to be followers of Jesus. We gather, we assemble as a unified body, but we must also care and love one another. As we've discovered this morning, our loving one another completes the cycle of God's coming to us. As we love one another, God's love is made real in us. It becomes a blazing sign to the world. That's a lot to take in. But it seems very clear in Scripture that we're called to love one another and to care for one another. So how does this play out here in our congregation? I think of coming back to the image of the wife caring for her husband with Alzheimer's is a good way to imagine what it looks like for our congregation to care for one another. Those in our midst that are suffering, we do what is necessary to care for them, no matter the cost. Sometimes this means visiting those in the hospital. Sometimes this means preparing a meal for those who can't prepare their own. Sometimes this means coming alongside of someone who are suffering and lending an open ear. Sometimes it means we cut the grass or clean the house uh, or another task that someone is unable to accomplish for themselves. And yes, sometimes it means we care with money. Do we care for one another? Do we authentically show the love of Christ to one another? Or according to John, if we fail to do this, we might as well pack up, close the doors. How's he calling you to respond this morning? Do you do, do, you do enough care, caring? Do you get it? Shall we prepare to shut the doors on your life? Or are you willing to fling them wide open for whatever God sends your way? I'll finish with this story. A young lady, a single mom who works for me in Atlanta, in my client services group, shared with me a couple of weeks ago that she had resolved to rendering at least, at least, one rectum act of caring each month in 2015. This means picking up a check for a young family or an older person in a restaurant, offering to help a young mother with a child who's crying in public, Helping a co-worker finish the task, even if it means she stays later after work and doesn't get paid. And the list goes on. You'll have your own list already. She suggested that I challenge you to resolve to do the same thing in 2015. That's 12 random acts of caring this year. And you're already two weeks behind. Because what you did the first two weeks don't count because you haven't been challenged yet. Once you look for these opportunities, I'll bet you'll stop keeping track and your number will far exceed one per month. 
because caring becomes a way of life. My challenge to you today, as your friend and co-church member, to live a life of caring, a life of love, and a life that most certainly reflects Jesus. Are you willing to complete the cycle? Are you just content to be an obstacle? So the real question is, as I close, how much of you are you willing to sacrifice to complete the kingdom of God? Let's pray. Our kind Heavenly Father, we come to you today in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What an awesome responsibility and an awesome chance it is to serve you in this caring and loving way. Speak to our heart today. As we leave this church, don't wait till tomorrow. Put someone in front of us today that can be cared in a way only we can care. And we will honestly give you the praise and the glory, and the world becomes a better place, one little piece of caring at a time. And we ask you this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Please stand and sing.